Welcome everyone to the Myth Salon. My name is Dana White. Once again, we are in troubling times. We're looking at the coronavirus moving upwards towards 800,000 people since the very beginning of the pandemic. And it just gives me pause to think about the nature of how community and what is sacred and what we hold dear to us and how that, how that factors into our whole way of being. So what I would like to do is, as I do, open the myth salon with a tone from the singing bowl. People throughout time and history have always had an impulse towards making the world sacred and finding divinities where they could. And whether those divinities were in nature or in the whole virtue character of existence, it is one of those attributes of the human psyche that as Joseph Campbell observes and Lionel Corbett, we have a religious function within the human psyche. And so tonight, what I would like to do is open with another reading as I did last week from the Tao Te Ching. I thought given the nature of what we're working with tonight with Athena and Arachne and weaving that uh, I would read the verse 15, which is entitled Weaving the Way. The Tao is as ancient as existence itself. The most venerable masters evolved in relation to the Tao a response to encountering the complexities of life and being. Their contact with the simple elegance of what is so must have been profound and unfathomable. For the surviving traces of their wisdom point to the subtleties of the Tao, but stop short of explaining them. Mysteries cling to every fiber of existence no matter the tenacious character of their inquiry. To pursue the Tao, they must be as fluid as water, yet precise and deliberate, as if weaving a path across thin ice, cautious like a warrior alert to possible threats. They must be reverent and courteous, as if meeting honored guests, flexible, the way flowers bend toward the sun, pure as an unblemished newborn, as receptive as an open valley and empty as a cavern. They must be selfless and as humble as sand beneath the waves. Waters, once cloudy with sediment, settle with stillness, becoming clear, able to nourish and reveal. To experience the Tao as the ancients did, follow the manifestations. Observe the choices emanating from the still point of the here and now into infinite possibility, mindful that the right path to take will come forth once the compass of the senses has been silenced. The ancients never sought fulfillment from the Tao. Participating in the changes manifest was sufficient, a reward in itself. Stitched from the threads of the Tao's sublime mystery, the fabric of existence guides and shelters the sage wherever he goes. He never wants for anything. Empty and available, the sage is patient and present weaving the way towards the eternal unfolding of the Tao. 
So I'd like now to turn that over to my very good friend and colleague who I'm gonna say to the, uh, the audience and the rest of the panelists, be easy on Will. He's in Germany right now, it's two o'clock in the morning. So we welcome you, Will. Thank you from across the seas and the time zones. Welcome to the Miss Salon with Diane Sherwood. Thanks, Dana. Um, yeah, uh, expected to be back uh, in, in LA by now and expected to be joining some of you for, for lunch next week. Um, didn't expect to get stuck in Germany. I'm here recording uh, recording a couple episodes, five episodes for a TV series on, on myths for, for ZDF, for a German TV channel. Um, but tonight is, is a really special night. And not only would I like never want to miss tonight, um, in part because of the conversation and, uh, and who's here, um, this has also actually been really relevant to the conversations I've been having all week with the producers of this, this TV series. There are two episodes, one on the Amazons, one on Pope Joan. And the, the main focus of, of both is about the feminine in, uh, in 2021 uh, and in the 2020s. And as I'm you know, trying to do my best to do what I can to, to do service to these two mythological topics, <laughs> the, the people and uh, that I keep thinking back to, so many of them are here uh, tonight. Um, so it feels very special and I'm very grateful. And I actually sent an email to another, another person that comes up in the context of this, the first person who taught me the story of Arachne and, and brought up the uh, motif of the silenced woman. Uh, responding with her weaving, uh, who was Chris Downing, another good friend of, of many of ours, uh, and a mentor who I wrote today just asking if she thought my theory about Moses was crazy. <laughs> we'll see what she thinks. Um, but tonight's very special. I'm very, very grateful to be here. I think tonight's going to be a very unique uh, evening uh, that we'll remember for a long time. I know we've actually been with Diane now for two evenings in a row on the Splendor Solace, and to me, I was really struck last time um, when we were talking about it the last two times, when we we're talking about the way that that text expresses um, a, a femininity responding to repression in a moment that it was maybe um, maybe a moment that was uh, a moment of heightened silencing as we moved into a new calendar and a new era, uh, a new era of European patriarchy. So uh, that's a really cool, uh, it was a really interesting, I was I had no idea to see the Splendor Solace this way. It was stunning and I, I didn't grasp the continuity. And so for those of you who are with us last time and are with us tonight, I hope you're thinking about the Splendor Solace as we move into this conversation um, about Arachne. And as we have several uh, new people, some people that you may not know tonight, I hope y'all will uh, be uh, be with me as I go through the details of all the bios tonight, and maybe a little bit longer than some of the others. And as, uh, and I also want to note that we miss Dennis tonight. Um, of course, we always want to have him with us. Uh, he is fine and well. Um, so with us tonight is Mary Doherty, uh, a Jungian psychoanalyst and art psychotherapist in private practice in Chicago. Uh, she's a former president, director of training, and chair of the program committee of the Jung Institute of Chicago former president of Chicago's Society of Jungian Analysts, and she served for eight years on the executive committee of the Council of North American Societies of Jungian Analysts. She's a contributing editor to the Journal of Jungian Theory and Practice, has numerous publications in analytical psychology, lectures on the clinical implications of gender and the use of active imagination and on the impact of Jung's thought on creative development and artistic production. Uh, as a printmaker, printmaker and performance artist, she has exhibited nationally and internationally. And in 2001, she was awarded the Lifetime Achievement in the Arts Award of, by the Chicago Women's Caucus for the Arts. Hi, Mary. Thanks for joining us for the first time tonight. Uh, Y'all know Sophie, Sophie uh, Dufresne, uh, who has been a frequent panelist of the Myth Salon. She transformed a career in engineering and technology to become a highly sought after professional illustrator and designer working in technology design and illustration. Uh, digital graphics and animation and hand-drawn or painted illustration. Her work uh, is as fresh as it is archetypal. She's a graduate of the Jungian Certificate Program created by the Los Angeles Jung Institute. Uh, Dr. Boris Matthews is with us tonight who graduated from the C.G. Jung, in Jung Institute of Chicago and maintains a practice of analytical psychology in the Milwaukee and Madison, Wisconsin areas. Uh, he's particularly interested in working with persons who recognize need to develop a balanced adaptation to the outside and to the inside worlds. Uh, work that involves awareness of the individual psychological typology, dreams, active imagination, and spiritual concerns 
are integral elements in the analytic work, the ultimate goal of which is to develop a functioning dialogue with the non-ego center, the self. He serves as the director of training and analyst training program, regularly teaches classes for the analytical candidates and conducts study groups in Madison, as well as by video conference. We're joined by our friend, Dr. Connie Zweig, uh, another of our regular Myth Salon panelists, uh, author of Meeting the Shadow and Romancing the Shadow. Uh, some of you may have been with her recently for her public program at Pacifica. Uh, she did an event with us, A Moth to the Flame, The Life of the Sufi Poet Rumi, and is now a retired therapist. She has extended shadow work into late life and teaches aging is a spiritual practice, which is the focus of her latest book, The Inner Work of Age, Shifting Role to Soul. Uh, that this, this week is the winner of the American Book Fest Book Award. We're also here tonight with Dr. Maria Tatar. Hi, Maria. Um, I'm very grateful that Maria is here. Um, we got to work together on my dissertation, and she joined me for a, a brief adventure in the Joseph Campbell Writers Room at, uh, at Hushin, which was at the time Relativity School. Uh, Dr. Maria Tatar earned her doctorate from Princeton. Uh, joining the faculty of Harvard in 1971. She is the John Lowe Professor of Germanic Languages and Literatures and Chair of the Committee on Degrees in Folklore and Mythology at Harvard University. She's written more than a dozen books on folklore and mythology, and last year she released uh, The Fairest of Them All, Snow White, and 21 uh, Tales of Mothers and Daughters. And this year, as many of you know and, and read in The Times, uh, she released The Heroine of a Thousand and One Faces, which we hope we'll get to talk with uh, her more about probably than we'll get to tonight. But thank you for being with us, Maria. Um, and as we'll find, the themes and motifs in that book uh, have are exactly why we reached out, Dana reached out uh, to invite her to join us tonight. It was too resonant and relevant. Dr. Diane Sherwood, uh, finally, uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, Diane discovered her love of the beautiful alchemical paintings and the illuminated alchemical manuscript of the uh, Splendor Solace. <laughs> As a very young child traveling Europe in collaboration with the late Dr. Joseph L. Henderson, in 2003, she wrote Transformation of the Psyche, the Symbolic Alchemy of the Splendor Solace. Our past two Miss Salons were devoted to Dr. Diane Sherwood and the Splendor Solace, videos of which have been viewed by more than 700 people in the few short weeks since they were uploaded, um, all of our good friends. She's a Jungian analyst and sand play therapist who did her analytic training at the Young Institute of San Francisco and is now a member of the Young Institute of Chicago. It's an honor, Diane, and it's been wonderful speaking with you and being in correspondence over these last several weeks. Thank you for being with us tonight and for leading this conversation. Thank you for this warm welcome. And um, I'm so happy to see this panel. I can't wait to hear from all of you um, because what I'm talking about is not a topic is a topic that so many of us have spent our lives struggling with and thinking about. And so, ma so many people are writing about, there's such good energy for it. So um, I'm gonna just jump right in. In Ovid's Metamorphoses, we are told of the encounter between the Greek goddess Athena and an ordinary woman Arachne, and we learn what fate awaits a woman who challenges patriarchal entitlement by daring to portray the transgressions of male gods against mortal women. Are we still living within the myths of the heroic age of Greece? Just want to um, clarify a few things before we get going. Um, there's been a whole thing about matriarchy versus patriarchy. I don't, as we were seeing in the uh, Splendor Solace lecture last time, that um, really I don't think is what where we need to be focusing um, with the fantasy that there was once matriarchy and now there's patriarchy. I think that's a those are projections that people have made onto pa past history. If we are, I actually think that if we make the distinction by asking whether men or women have more power or dominance, then our question is coming from a patriarchal point of view rather than a related um, feminine point of view. And I'm not saying men and women here, I'm saying the attitudes and the views and using feminine and patriarchal as cultural constructs um, rather than biological constructs. The Olympian model is power oriented, oriented and dominance through strength, fear, and law giving. 
On the left, though, in the slide, we see the goddess with her two attendant animals. So I want to clarify for people who aren't um, died in the wool Jungians, um, what we talk when we talk about the feminine principle and the masculine principle, we talk about the feminine principle principle of eros and the masculine principle of logos. And again, this is cultural, not about men versus women, but it, it overlaps, it's enmeshed in it. So the feminine principle of eros is related, connected, receptive, subjective, empathic, not passive. Receptive is not passive, it's very active. Feeling, um, we talk about the feeling function. It isn't, doesn't mean emotion. It's an objective function that knows the value of things, what is important. And that is connected to the feminine principle. Numinosity inhabits one's daily life. The earth is sacred. These are all things that are connected with it, but not essential. A woman's body and all bodies, all living things are sacred. And we learn from nature. So that's that receptivity to be patient and observe and learn. The masculine principle of logos is removed, objective, rule-based. The Olympian model is that the gods don't have to follow the same rules as humans. Thinking is an, is an objective function, but of course, without values, thinking can be applied to anything. The idea is uh, in the masculine uh, principle, spirit comes from above, from the top down. The, and then more recently, this idea that the earth is for humans to use. Oh, and, and a corollary of that is that bodies are for people to use. And this I have here, a woman's body is for men to use as in the Greeks, but really women use their own bodies. I, I wanna just mention Joseph Henderson again. Um, he's, he was um, the only, um, those of you who were in the previous lectures heard about him um, and his, his pioneering work with the Splendor Solace of which I became a part near the end of his life. Um, he was the only American contributor that Jung chose to write a chapter in Man and His Symbols. And he wrote about ancient myth and modern man. And he wrote about the use of myths for dream interpretation, but he did not agree that myths re reflect the primordial psyche. And he also felt that in interpreting dreams that amplification was not enough. Those were some of his big points. This is a painting that he made a very, at a crucial time when he was in analysis with Jung. And um, he actually loaned me his painting so I could scan it. I couldn't believe it, but he did. It was very generous. It was recorded by Ovid um, around 1 CE and his long poem, uh, Metamorphoses. And so this was a long time after the story took place, but we really don't have an earlier source for it. There must have been, but uh, we don't have that. And it's a pretty small, it's, it's just a, you know, a few verses and, um, and yet it's grabbed our imaginations. Now in uh, Ovid's story, Arachne was a young woman living in Lydia in Asia Minor. And I want to show you some things on this map so that you can get a sense of where things are. You can see where Troy is in the Trojan War. And Lydia is across the sea of Marmara um, on the, between the Black Sea and the Bosphorus. So it's this area right up here and um, to the upper right. And then um, if you look, Athens is quite far away from there. Um, and the, the Peloponnesus um, is even a little further where you can see um, with Cor Corinth and Mycenae and Olympia. 
And then Mount Olympus is there, you see, in the north, um, closer to Macedonia. So when the Greeks were traveling to Troy, you can see how they got stuck there because it was so far away. And Lydia was even further. But um, if you, you can't see it on this map, but at the very bottom center, you can see that there's some writing that's cut off. And just, just below there is the island of Crete. And um, while we're looking at the map, I want you to just keep in mind that the pe people from Crete settled, they were great traders, and then they started migrating and they settled all the way up in Lydia. And so the, from uh, things, hints in the poem and things um, that we know about the migrations, the colony in Lydia at that time was made up from migrants from Crete. So in the story, she's a young woman who's a master weaver and she's living in Lydia in Asia Minor. And her fame reaches the goddess Athena all the way over there in Greece. And, um, and Athena was honored by the Greeks at that time um, as the bringer of weaving to humans, among other things. And so Arachne's fame threatened the proper order of the world. The gods must have superior power and skill compared uh, to humans. And but also by extrapolation, the Greeks, like so many conquerors, believed that their culture was superior to the cultures of people that they conquered. So Athena became enraged and she decides to conduct an undercover investigation. She disguised herself as a harmless looking old woman and visited Arachne. Athena brought the conversation around to herself did Arachne owe her skill with weaving to the goddess Athena? According to Ovid, Arachne answered in a disrespectful tone, Athena should come and bring her own loom and we'll see who's the better weaver. Athena then revealed her true identity and immediately took up the challenge. The contest was a great event attended by gods and mortals. Athena's tapestry was woven with great skill. On it, she portrayed the greatness of the Greek gods and the punishments inflicted on humans who challenged them. Arachne wove an exquisite and heartbreaking tapestry. Unlike Athena's praise of the male gods and warriors, Arachne's illustrated the transgressions of the Olympian gods toward human women. Athena again became enraged at the insult to the gods. And she took up her shuttle and she hit Arachne in the forehead and she tore up her tap tapestry. And so Arachne hanged herself. This is um, from an illustration, this image is from an illustration um, of um, the Inferno, of Dante's Inferno. And you can see the kind of humili the humiliation of her naked body and the humiliation of this woman. So Athena then cursed Arachne, who had, was hanged, and turned her into a spider. Athena really did not like spiders. I don't think many of us really do. So there's the tale. That's, that's really all that's said. So it would be easy to view this story as typifying the themes of classical Greek drama, which often explore the difficult relationship between gods and mortals and the problems of hubris and nemesis. Arachne's story is at first glance a lesson in hubris or in contemporary terms, a warning about the danger of an inflated ego. She thought herself equal to a goddess and she paid dearly for it. 
Hubris is the hallmark of the uninitiated hero, which by the way, was a, a real theme that Henderson brought out in his book, Thresholds of Initiation, the, un, the, um, that Campbell's heroes were largely uninitiated heroes. And the initiated hero has, um, has had to face failure and, to, and come through it. And it's a whole different kind of person comes out um, when the ego has been challenged and something larger has had, uh, the self has had to be called upon. So hubris is the hallmark of the uninitiated hero who must experience and learn from failure in order to develop maturity of judgment. We might also say that Athena was Arachne's nemesis, the one who gave Arachne what she was due. In other words, the appropriate consequence of her attitudes. But if we go beneath the surface of the tale, um, we can remind ourselves that the gods and goddesses were represented primarily in human form, and they transgressed the rules of human society. Their myths are full of lust, envy, pride, selfishness, trickery, impulsivity, lack of remorse, and the need for vengeance. All of very human. Um, so let's talk about Athena. I love this image of her. The Greek, and go a little bit beneath the, the story. So the Greek poet Homer wrote of the gray-eyed Athena. She was beautiful, strong, and much loved by her father, the most powerful god Zeus. She was benevolent toward humans, bringing skills and culture. And she also was a support to the Greek heroes who went to fight in far off lands. She was always one of my favorites, a model of strength, and I thought, independence. We think about her in the modern psyche. Um, I think she's popular with a lot of strong women because she was strong. But let's look at the story of her conception and birth. That's always tells us something when, when the beginning of things. And it's really tragically symbolic. Athena's father mated with the goddess Metis, whose wisdom was unsurpassed. She was one of the last goddesses who was her own person with her own powers. In some versions, Metis had helped Zeus to overthrow his own father, but usually it's Rhea, his mother, who's the one who does that, who tricks Kronos so that he doesn't eat Zeus. Now, Zeus worried that if Metis gave birth to a son, that the son would overthrow him. So Zeus decided to kill Metis. He played a game with her. Each of them changed their shapes into animals, playing and fighting with one another. He then challenged her to take the form of a tiny fly, and he offered her honey. When she became stuck in the honey, he quickly ate her. But the problem was not solved so easily. When Zeus swallowed Metis, she was pregnant with her first child. She remained in the belly of Zeus with a daughter growing inside of her. She built a forge in his belly and made a helmet for her daughter to protect her. For Zeus, the fire in his belly was agonizing. So now a man gets to be, sort of gets to be pregnant by swallowing a woman. Finally, the pain was so great that he asked to have his head cleaved with an ax. When his skull opened, he gave birth to Athena through the top of his head. She's born regaled in full armor. The girl child Athena was wise, noble, beautiful, and heroic. As Karenyi points pointed out, she's the ultimate father's daughter. She's born from his head, which I interpret to symbolize that she's a male fantasy. She's, she's not, she doesn't come from the feminine. She comes from the father's head. So here we have an anima projection onto the daughter and she lives out this anima projection. 
In Greek culture, Athena took the place of goddesses and their mysteries in the cultures conquered by the Greeks. The goddesses symbolizing the sacred feminine were demoted to a motherless daughter in service of her father. So in a way she swallows up all of the functions of goddesses to be within the patriarchy. The owl, a symbol of wisdom, was attributed to her. And here, I love this one. The owl just looks, <laughs> the expression on the owl um, doesn't look very happy. I'm not sure he really wants to be with her. On her shield, she carried the face of the Gorgon, the terrible devouring side of the primal feminine. I believe the Gorgon lost its meaning as a guardian of the earth's sanctity and her wrath when that sacredness was violated. And there, the earth was so sacred that there were special guilds of miners, for example, and they had to go through all kinds of ceremonies when they took something from the earth. Instead, the Gorgon came to symbolize masculine fear of the feminine. So now let's consider Arachne. Ovid's version of the myth contains odd details, such as the name of Arachne's father, that can give us clues to the moment in actual history from which the myth arose. And I've just, I did a lot of um, research in the classical and archeological uh, literature um, and in the mythological various versions of myths um, to try to put this together. Um, it also turns out that the English translations of the Latin poem made Arachne appear more arrogant than was actually implied by Ovid. The classic scholar, um, Julia Dyson Jedduk, um, looked at the wording in Latin where um, Arachne was supposed to be so arrogant and actually, if, if you've ever translated Latin, there are places where there are ambiguities and I, you have to wonder if there are intentional ambiguities in the, in the phrasing. Um, but she said that the phrase can also be translated that she could not refuse the challenge of a God, which would be a very different attitude. So um, I want to say a little bit about the Minoan culture that was on Crete. Remember, I showed you it was at the bottom of that other map. Lydia is, is up in um, Asia, over here in Asia Minor. But the point is that um, the people from Crete had migrated there. And the, Crete was an extremely prosperous, wealthy, and very advanced uh, culture at that time. The men were um, great businessmen and, and traders. And they made the beautiful purple cloth that only royalty could wear with a special dye. And it was, it was especially valuable because it didn't fade in the sun. And, um, and they kept that as a secret process for millennia. Um, they, no one knew how they did it, so they had a monopoly on it. And they were also great weavers, metal workers, and pottery makers. And I think everybody knows about the, also the goddess worship in Crete as well. This is Sybil, who was a goddess she came up in one of the Splendor Solace lectures um, in the frieze where um, Alexander met Diogenes. And, um, and here she is again. And so she's the goddess who was dominant in that um, Asia minor, minor culture. So lovely. See how she has one hand over her heart? And she's holding the ball, but it's in a, she's not grasping it, it's, it's open. And her headdress is amazing. Like they're in, in some cultures, all those levels represent different levels of consciousness. I wanna remind you 
um, that in Minoan culture, there's a real uh, feeling for the natural world, the beauty, the movement, the grace. And um, it wasn't a matriarchal culture though. It was ruled by male kings and women were highly respected and, were, and served as priestesses. And you may know that some people think that the reason that priests, like in the Catholic church, wear long clothes is that women were the priestesses earlier on. And so the men kept wearing dresses. I don't know if that's so, but it's one bit of speculation. So here we have this famous snake goddess. And this is a signet ring, which shows some women, one woman on the left holding flowers under a tree, resting under a tree. Women, the other women are, seem to be having a conversation. So this um, sensitivity to the natural world is seen in their culture. And so this is the culture that Arachne came from. It also, I noticed in some of the friezes that it seems to be multicultural. You see how there um, are people with different um, lightnesses and darknesses of, of skin. So here's Sybil again. I'm going to just go through these pictures. Here's another signet ring, another one some friezes, you see the, the men rowing in their boats. They're rowing not for war, they're traders. It's a lovely picture of a deer and a woman playing an instrument. This is really beautiful with the, perhaps the moon and the two birds. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing there. This is my, my imagination, but woven in with historical and archeological facts. So by transforming Arachne into a spider who would weave forever, Athena silenced her, but we might imagine unwittingly cursed her with immortality. Weaving together details from Ava's vivid poetry with archeological research, I have imagined that Arachne wove her own symbolic Cretan hieroglyphs into her webs, filling cave after cave, and that these have been discovered. I present here a tr preliminary translation. I am a creature of silence, yet I have a tale to tell. I am a weaver, a listener. I am sensitive to the smallest vibrations, to the sound made by a graceful gesture or by the tiniest insect creeping along a leaf. I was taught at a very young age to observe how things are done. I watched not just once, but many times in different contexts. I learned what was essential and what was incidental. I see from many perspectives. And I notice the way muscles are tight or relaxed, how the trajectory of a movement is related to the whole body, and how movements can create images without the mover being aware of it. Those images remain invisible without a medium, but I have the gift of sight. Images created by unselfconscious movement remind me of playing in the sand by the river very long ago when I was a young girl. Sometimes I would dance and twirl and then see the pattern my feet had made on the sand, circles and spirals, wild and messy ones. I would draw on the sand, letting my arms and fingers move where they chose, rather than with a pattern in mind. I would decorate them with small stones and flowers, with ribbons my mother had woven in my hair. 
I love this hot night on. At other times, I gathered twigs and crisscrossed them and stood them up, taking a spider's web and stretching it between. My grandmother laughed as she shared my joy at play. And though she said nothing to me, she saw that I had the family gift as a weaver. It wasn't long before she had me sit with her and help her in small ways as she spun and carded the wool. Our family belonged to a guild of weavers renowned for the fine quality of our cloth. The merchant guild traded our textiles throughout the Aegean and into the Mediterranean. We took pride in the care, focus, and integrity that we brought to our work. In those days, work was sacred and each guild had prayers and ceremonies known only to its members. We prayed to the goddess Sybil at dawn and we danced and made offerings to her at sunset. The repetition of weaving was powerful, taking us into a state of awareness larger than what was in front of our eyes. It was Sybil who guided our movements and weaving was like a prayer to her. All of this may seem strange to you, but long ago, this is the way things were and had been for as long as our story keepers could tell. Our people had migrated to the coast of Asia Minor from Crete, Ariadne's home, and we brought with us the love of dance and games of music that stirs the heart and beckons the body to move. You've not heard our stories, nor of the poets of ancient Lydia. They did not sing only of war, but also of the beauty of nature and praise of the mystery of life, of gods and goddesses who were part of life of earth and sky and the stories of ancestors. We listened to the plants and animals. We observed and learned from their ways. We placed our ears against the earth to hear the beat of her heart. Our priests and priestesses journeyed in trance to the world below and to the world of the stars above to bring back wisdom, healing, and portents of the future. Idmon, my father, was not of noble birth, but he was the guardian of our people's secret method for making purple dye. Ovid pointed out that I was of lowly and what he called vulgar birth, and that I had become famous entirely because of my skill. His tone was one of derision. In this, the poet himself identified with me, for he too was of lowly birth and a great weaver, that is, of tales. I became a weaver of tapestries, creating whole scenes that seemed to flow from my fingers. And yet I took infinite care. Just to see my artistry, the nymphs would leave their usual haunts in the hills or near gurgling brooks. They would come down from the vineyards and from the river Pactolus with its golden rocks and cooling water. The water nymphs, the Nayas, came to watch with fascination. No doubt you have heard of the great poet Homer, who sang of the Aegean heroes from the city-states on the mainland of Greece. It was not long before my birth when, as Homer tells, they looked across the sea with envy toward the flourishing towns of Asia Minor, when they banded together and attacked the city of Troy, our sister city, our warriors left to go to their aid. After the Battle of Troy, the Greeks always, with their eyes on the spoils, raided our defenseless cities and villages. We became slaves of the Greeks. Such is the way of the world from time before memory and up to the present time and into the future. The Greeks took our wealth, killed our brothers and sons and grandfathers, and they took the girls and women as slaves and concubines. When we wove cloth for the Greeks, we no longer asked Sybil for her blessings, and thus the quality of the purple cloth. Now, in those old times, gods and goddesses lived in certain places and belonged with the people who lived there. When people moved, their gods went with them, at least for a time. So it was that the mainland Greeks brought the gods and goddesses who lived on Mount Olympus to my home in faraway Lydian Colophon. The ways of these gods were shocking to us because the goddess of the earth had been overthrown 
and the balance between the gods and goddesses no longer restored harmony in people's lives and hearts. A great male god Zeus rolled over all the god, ruled over all the gods and goddesses on Mount Olympus and indulged his lust and aggression with impunity. Olympus was a chaotic and unhappy place, a place without honor, order, delicacy, or reflection. Marriage, the great union of opposites to create new life, was no longer sacred. It was not until many generations later that the story of my remarkable transformation was written down by the poet Ovid in his great poem, Metamorphoses, in which he speaks of the Olympian gods and their shape-shifting and their power to change the shape of mortals. As Ovid told it, Athena's influence could be seen in every thread, and yet I scornfully denied this. I was accused of disowning my heavenly mistress never asking for her help. Ovid also noted that my mother had recently died, which is true. I had just returned to weaving, having completed a time in the temple of the goddess Sybil, where I prayed and performed rituals dedicated to my mother and the mothers who came before her. Ovid claimed that Athena disguised herself as an old woman and approached me, and to her face, I denied that I owed my skill to her. It is true. I would not falsely humble myself. I laughed and gently told the old woman that her mind had become confused, that my weaving was an ancient art passed down through hundreds of generations. I did not speak of Sybil, for we did not speak of her to outsiders. When the old woman pressed me, I teased her that Athena should come and weave next to me and we could see the result. Thus it was that I, a maid of lowly birth, was tricked by Athena into challenging her. Athena and I were to weave side by side so that our tapestries would bear witness to whether goddess or mortal would be victor. Abu did not understand the rhythm of weaving, so he did not recreate its cadences in his poetry. He described our contest like the collar at a chariot race. And this is this is the um, Dryden's translation. Straight to their post appointed both repair and fixed their threaded looms with equal care. Around the solid beam the web is tied while hollow canes the parting warp divide through which with nimble fight the shuttles play and for the woof prepare a ready way. The woof and warp unite pressed by the toothy sleigh Thus both their mantles button to their breast, their skillful fingers ply with willing haste and work with pleasure while they cheer the eye with glowing purple of the Tyrian dye. Athena wove a most beautiful tapestry in praise of the gods of Olympus and in praise of herself, showing that she was chosen over Poseidon, god of the sea, to be the patron of the great city of Athens. Her tapestry was balanced and formal, according to some, even reflecting a sanctimonious calm. Other great feats of power she did show, as well as the way gods punish humans who challenge their beauty or power. Yet I was unimpressed with what she had chosen to portray. The Olympian gods seemed to me impostors, concerned with their own desires and importance. Was I to honor such gods? They were neither wise nor just. They lived in the sky and knew nothing of the spirit that lives in the earth. Was I to kneel before them, make sacrifice, pray to them for guidance? No. Let Athena take her vengeance upon me. It is not for me to praise my own skill. I leave that to Ovid who wrote that my tapestry was perfect in every technical respect, woven of many colors and threads of gold. I illustrated the way Zeus, Neptune, Apollo, Bacchus, and Saturn tricked and violated maiden, maidens in order to satisfy their lust. I confronted the virgin goddess with her father's axe, his transformation of himself into animals, a bull, a swan, a snake, 
to violate innocent maidens. As gold, he entered Danai's heart. The fair Nemazani thought her lover was a shepherd. As I wove my tapestry, I was praying to Sybil, and her compassion guided me to omit the story of Athena's own mother, who had been her father's victim. When Athena saw my tapestry, she was filled with envy and rage. She grabbed her shuttle and beat me on the forehead, that place of my third eye that saw the truth of things that she would deny. Now, Ovid claims that I hanged myself on a beam and that Athena took pity on me. But I ask you, does this fit the tale? No, it shall not stand. In truth, I did throw a rope over a beam, but only to escape her blows. Her heavy armor prevented her from following me as her power seemed to dwindle before my eyes. The many onlookers, both gods and humans, gasped. She destroyed my tapestry, but I wonder, could she forget it? She raged on, and not able to reach me, she threw a poison over me. And so it was that I was turned into a spider, fated to weave forever. And so it is that I have lived over these many centuries, a silent observer, traveling from place to place, on the wind, on sailing ships, in the hair of slaves, and then the silks of royalty. So that's my little imaginary story of her getting to tell her own story. But it's based on things from uh, my research as well. I want to make a few comments um, about the psychological aspects of this and then go a little bit deeper. And we'll, we'll go through this fairly quickly. So I want to ask, is it possible that this pair, Athena and Arachne, constitute a psychological complex, a pair of polar opposites? Might Athena have envied Arachne, who lived in a nurturing world where women had their own power? Athena was born with armor, was never held or nurtured. Her mother's wisdom and identity were swallowed by her father symbolic of the plight of too many women, what then can they offer their daughters? If we can recognize the Athena and the Arachne within ourselves, then we have identified a dilemma. We want, I wonder, are they irreconcilable? Might they begin to recognize value in the other, perhaps through the wisdom of the body? The myths of the Olympian gods reflect a profoundly different ethos from the Greece of the mysteries of dream incubation of the wounded healer Chiron. The Olympian myths teach us about the shadow qualities of power, envy, and lust. They captivate us because they are part of the fabric of Western attitudes and culture and of human nature. In more than one therapeutic process, I've observed a transformation of Olympian attitudes and the redemption of feminine, feminine qualities and values. This is in both men and women. New myths, new deep structures of psyche may emerge during treatment. People come up with their own stories that are like myths. Now, Francis Cornford made a very, he was a, the great um, Plato scholar at um, at Oxford, and, and by the way, he was also Joseph Henderson's father-in-law, and Joseph Henderson was kind of adopted into their family. Um, he really felt like they were more his family than the one he grew up with, who were bankers. And Francis Cornford, in his book, From Religion to Philosophy, describes the transition in Greek culture from the fate that was a part of nature represented by Mara comes to be thought of as enacted by the sole will of a supreme personal God. In other words, becomes an act of legislation. That's his quote from him. So instead of, this is a huge shift in consciousness. Later in the same work, Cornford writes, for lack of the mystical link of communion, the Olympian recedes from man as well as from nature. 
the power formerly, formerly used with law-abiding regularity to dispense its benefits is now a capricious and arbitrary will, differing from a human will only in the superiority of its strength. You know, this, it just seems so timely right now that there's a kind of intensity that's happening with these, with the cultural forces that are really at war. And, and we have a kind of Zeus-like figure, um, the person that um, one of my favorite commentators always refers to as the disgraced ex-president, to be above the rules that ordinary people have to follow. So Cornford goes on to say, once more, earth and heaven are parted asunder. The gap has come into being. And Olympian theology is clear that this gap is not to be bridged by Eros. In Plato's Symposium, the physician Eryxmachus speaks of the Eros who is orderly and indeed is the principle which binds all things into an order, a cosmos, or a harmony. Remember how I said that the feeling function you know what's important. It's not about emotionality or emotion. It's about knowing what, how to value things. That's a different kind of order than rules. So the sanctity of bodies, not just women's bodies, um, was not compatible in, with the culture of warriors who spent many years away from their family, killed the males and conquered groups and took the women as spoils of war. This has happened all over, not just with the Greeks. If we think about Zeus, um, his consciousness does not develop. In the myths, we don't see him developing. You can't develop when you don't have anything to contain you. With a complete lack of true eros, he kills his loyal companion through a trick, betraying her trust and her vulnerability. He eats her just as his father ate his children. In a primitive way, he wants, he incorporates her. I find this mythology to be primitive, regressive, and destructive. It is literally not generative, except to produce a female deity, Athena, who is masculine and is a father's daughter in her father's service and remains a virgin. It is misogynist. We live in the shadow of our Greek heritage, but we must also ask whether it has lasted because there is something universal about it. When men become conquerors, they lose the civilizing influence of women. The ingestion of Medus, I feel, represents the destruction of the sacred feminine. And the, I also feel that the creation of Athena marks a turning point in human cultural history the deep potentiation of feminine values, of the sacredness of the earth, of intuition, of different qualities of consciousness and the wisdom to be learned from the natural world. In addition, the symbols of feminine wisdom and power are, they're appropriated, but they lose their meaning. They become like signs of power rather than pointing to a much deeper lived, felt, experienced, uh, meaning. Athena was the perfect protect protectress for the Greek warriors, herself a powerful warrior. Being a identified somewhat with Athena in working on this story, um, I came to feel like she was a big trick played on us. Um, and as I was, and just continuing this theme in the splendor solace of the woman standing on the earth with the moon shining with her own light. I'm not suggesting that we need to go back to anything, but the things in us as men and women, as human beings have become very limited by this patriarchal point of view. It, it, traps us in um, a mode of living that misses out as if we can't see 
all of the other ways of experiencing the world. And um, so that's, I think, really what I want to get at. And um, I'm dying to hear from all of you. Thank you, Diane. Gosh, and and uh, and so am I. And and you know, I I definitely have lots of thoughts and reflections. And you've been so inspiring with this. And one thing I just always love are um, stories that demonstrate how a deeper research into the material, into the myths, uh, and into the psychology of the myths can lead to more profound and exciting tellings of the stories. Uh, so thank you for you know expressing and living that telling and and that point. I'd like to, you know, just open it up to, I, I, I don't know, I'm sure everybody will turn off their mute button at once, but, but um, would love to open up to anybody who has a, has a first thought they'd like to bring in. Oh, well, I would love to ask about Anansi, whether you have looked at uh, the uh, Ashanti figure, uh, the spider god, uh, who is all half god, half mortal, uh, and connected with storytelling and wisdom. Uh, and you know his um, uh, his craft uh, is extraordinary. He's also a trickster figure, so I'm sure you're aware of him. Uh, so I'd love to hear about that. But I also wondered if you could say maybe a word about Medusa. And I mean, there we have another woman who was raped uh, by Poseidon in a temple, and then ends up uh, turning from a woman who was once beautiful into this figure of horror who is then imposed on Athena's uh, shield. So, you know, it's wonderfully complicated. And then uh, just one, oh, two quick comments. One, uh, The Color Purple, Alice Walker's book, which yeah. gives the Sealy as, as, a, as a new Arachne. And, um, and then uh, Philomela weaving a crime, her own sexual assault into a tapestry. So thank you for so much rich material. And uh, I loved your reconfiguring, reconstellation, rethinking of the myth. And uh, you know, it reminds me of all the wonderful things that are being done by Pat Barker and Madeline Miller. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh. And yeah. uh, Natalie Haynes uh, with um, The Silence of the Girls, uh, Circe, and so on. So thank you for that. Yeah, those are fabulous books. They're yeah. quite extraordinary. And suddenly you see that the whole story changes as soon as the perspective changes. And, uh, you know, the fact that you can see inside the minds of the characters, which is something you can't do with the, the myths. You don't know much about what is going on inside the heads of the characters, uh, save for Zeus. <laughs> Since he, he gives birth. There's so much related material. I love to pick up some of those threads on, you know, Anansi Medusa uh, jumped out to me as well before before we move on to some other stuff. And, you know, Anansi uh, is as a trickster is subversive. Uh, and clearly that's partially what Arachne is. Your, your Arachne especially is being subversive in her telling of a, of a story. Mm -hmm. This She's silenced, but then is subversive. And I, I love that detail. And I've been trying to make a lot of sense of Medusa and this Gorgon image as well, because it shows up on the shields of many Amazons. And um, one of the things I've been trying to make sense of is you mentioned that the Gorgon, um, I wrote it down. I liked how you said it. The Gorgon, terrible devouring side of the feminine. <laughs> um, and of course, you see that that's, you know, in the story, we get the sense that that is if that's on the spectrum with this terrible devouring side and, and some other you know side, then we get this idea that she's sent there by the trauma. It leads to that transformation of that character. Um, but what I find so interesting about it being on the shield of Athena and on the shield of a Gorgon, and, and I don't know, this might, I don't know if you would resonate with this or not, but to me, it seems like almost like if you have uh, the, the Maenads or the Gorgons representing this unbound energy, this unbound feminine vitality, uh, then when you see something like an Amazon, maybe Athena, but, you know, an Amazon, you maybe do you see that exact energy focused and channeled into something, you know, that can be direct, even like Artemis's arrow or something. I don't know. Does that mm -hmm. resonate with any of y'all? 
You know, I'm not a, it's not my specialty. I don't, I'm not a, um, a scholar of Greek myth. And so my research is somewhat narrow in working on this. But um, I, I wonder with this tongue sticking out, whether um, it might have to do with some kind of ingestion of hallucinogens and going into an altered state, mm -hmm. um, you know, with, and with the, um, the tongue going out, that it might be some kind of strange trance-like state it was part of an Athenian ritual. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this whole thing where they would like hold an image of Medusa behind the Greek boy's head. And then they would put the mirror in front of him. And then he would look at the face as though he's looking at his own face, but instead he would see Medusa's face. Mm, and, oh. and I don't know all the meanings of it, but that was that was part of a part of a ritual uh, for transformation, um, hallucinogens potential. <laughs> I, I, I would like to comment on the just the psychological component that got stirred up for me. And that is uh, the trauma suffered by both uh, Arachne and Medusa, uh, you know, uh, could be seen as uh, negative symptoms that emerge from the traumatized person. That's why it's so important to, you know, to think about the post-traumatic stress disorder as a, a possible uh, reclassification uh, for uh, many other disorders that have been like the borderline disorder, for example. So if we begin to see uh, borderline disorder as a uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, and then we would be looking at the myth of a Medusa. You know, she was really the traumatized uh, victim of her, of the rape. And I think, um, so that's, that's one thing. The other thing I, I think about is how many women are ripped away from being their mother's daughters because of uh, the mother's own uh, suffering uh, and uh, the, they're having been swallowed by some form of the masculine. And uh, so that the girl comes into the world not being able to look back up into their mother's vagina, but to set their being born into a world where they have no origin. So the psychological disconnection that can happen, the denigrated feminine. So I, I think these myths can, uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm thinking clinically now because that's my job, but at any rate, just to, just to uh, add on to some of these thoughts. Yes, I, you know, Athena is also traumatized. Yes, absolutely. And she doesn't look like she is. So uh, here's a confession. I'm a recovered Athena woman. I lived that story for the whole first half of my life. Really, every bit of it. Father's daughter, unbonded to men, supporting the heroes, the whole deal. And it doesn't, it looks very woven together, but it's rooted in trauma. Yes, it's rooted in the trauma of yes. patriarchal masculinity and devouring the mother and the feminine. It's important, I think, to distinguish between gender and archetype because we're kind of a little bit sloppy here with women and feminine and men and masculine. So I had a patriarchal ego. There's right. the there's that right, and yes. it's not only men who have patriarchal egos. Right. Yeah. So when I was listening and I was kind of imagining this psychological relationship between the two figures and I was kind of feeling into who am I identifying with now in the story, right? I'm not identifying with Athena anymore in the story. I remember, I remember what that was like. And the envy, it's so much about envy. Yes. But then there's this strange thing where she, where Arachne hangs herself, right? Self-destruction after being kind of annihilated by the patriarchal woman, mm -hmm. goddess. And then she's reborn. So there's this death and resurrection kind of theme. And what is she reborn as? The ultimate weaver, right. which is so paradoxical when you think that it's, you know, that the, 
that the competition came out of envy. I don't know. Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, I, I just want to clarify one thing. The idea that the, uh, the uh, father's daughter was the result of a swallowed mother. I yes. just, and so the feminine, uh, and I agree with you, we're, we, we're mixing terms here, but uh, uh, the, many women have been swallowed so that there was no woman to identify with. Yes. So that was I, my experience. Well, it was also mine. I had a different experience than you, Connie, but uh, uh, the, um, the destruction of our mothers uh, under, under and, and this is true for men too. They also don't have mothers to identify with. So that the whole world that, that Diane so beautifully described between uh, the relatedness, I don't even want to call it feminine, the relatedness versus the power over. This is what the world means, right? We're, we're still definitely struggling with this power over and none of the relatedness. We don't know how to relate to one another. And that's our struggle. You know, I mean, I'm going to just share one thing more and that is my own daughter uh, refuses to be vaccinated. So she can't come and visit me at Christmas. So there's a there's a, a rip, a tear there, because this whole thing has been so polarized and it's coming home to me in a very personal heartbreak. So, uh, you know, I'm just sharing this rip that happened and is still happening. The weaving and the unraveling. Yes, and the, and the destruction of the weaving. See, that's what yeah. the, the yeah. destruction of the the unraveling. I mean, it also reminds right. me of the Penelope. This was the this this weaving told the truth about the power structure, and it was destroyed. Now, how often does that happen? And it's fascinating to me that the the story stages a contest about creating beauty. I mean, think that if you go up the Trojan War, what, how did it start? A beauty contest um, and this kind of rivalry among women. So what do you make of the fact that they're competing with each other? Uh, they're using their craft as a form of competition. It kind of uh, changes the game. Um, what about the domestic crafts? Well, I think intrapsychically, you know, these two parts of us can be very split off and in a way um, competing with each other in a way. And the, you know, the kind of the way that the um, power over part and the more connected to the feminine part in me. I mean, I've had to work really hard to build those links. Mm -hmm those bridges well uh, one thing i'm just hearing kind of between between y'all about connection and about this these competitions do i remember correctly that these weavings are very differently structured i know it's in the metamorphosis somewhere i just can't remember if it's philomena but i think it's these two right where where athena's is very linear block mm -hmm. block block mm -hmm. block quilt quilt yeah. linear consciousness right yeah. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, Arachne's, if I remember right, is, is more web. And, and some people take this to be kind of like a wink from uh, Ovid, who's saying, this is how I wrote the metamorphosis. The metamorphosis, unlike the Aeneid, which is linear uh, mm -hmm. and hypermasculine, here's the metamorphosis, which is itself fluid, mm -hmm. which is itself moving. And one story goes to the next. And by the way, thanks, Dana. I think you supported one of the plays, versions of the metamorphosis I got to see in uh, Santa Barbara. Um, with the pool on stage and that that whole thing, which some of you guys might remember that one with Freud and everything. But uh, but I wonder if that's meaningful to you, where you see this this uh, instead of a linear structure, a web of of connections. Is this an important metaphor? Um, yes. For connection. I see that in my own writing over the decades, how the writing style has changed. I don't write from my mind anymore. Mm -hmm. Talking about writing, and that reminds me of. Um, you know, thank you for telling the story from the point of view of Rackney was really put yourself in that mindset and that made me imagine, you know, as if I'm weaving. And um, because it's an activity that is very repetitive, your mind wanders. So this is a time where you, woman would probably create stories in the minds. 
And um, I, I wonder if, not only you tell me, I don't know about the history of that time, but I wonder if the myth or Athena appeared because um, there was a need in the psyche for that type of goddesses because the women were now being more um, impacted by a negative masculine or there might be developed an animus or there was a negative animus, but, and then the animus is responsible for a woman uh, a weaving, a spinning or weaving a story that then, you know, unconsciously. So how, how, is, how do you see that, um, that in that context, the weaving of a story unconsciously that manifests out in a, her own life? Sophie, could you say more about what you have in mind um, what I have in mind is that, I mean, I can actually read you a passage from, um, Barbara Hanna's writes a lot about the animus and she mm -hmm. has a couple chapters where she's talking about women's plots and she calls them where, um, let me, let me find this. She said, weaving the plots of lives is like leaving, like weaving in general as indeed being a feminine activity. The goddesses, not the gods, wove the web of fate. So weaving belongs to the feminine principle per se. But through the anima, men are no less involved in weaving unconscious plots. A little further, she says, um, plots are an extreme case of just uh, this compartment psychology in women. The hook on which a plot forms is usually a strong wish for something that is incompatible with conventional morality or with our usual point of view. What I mean to say here is as difficult as it is to see, there's a continuity. Yeah, she does mention also Eros. She says, when a woman offers such hooks, a less frequent enough occurrence these days, she is not living by the principle of Eros at all, but has allowed the goals of her enemies to become her own. So that there's the, that perhaps this, this story is, is a, portrays the, the, the struggle of a woman who might be weaving a plot unconsciously. And so bring in her own demise in a way. Doesn't anybody prideful kind of weave their own demise right into their own, you know, I have, my pride has woven my own narrative right into that destruction of my own pride. Uh, so that's a, that's an interesting question. Well, yeah. and I think that's what makes Arachne so heroic is that she dares not only to compete with the goddess to create a work of beauty, but also to call out the gods for their behavior. And, you know, the extraordinary thing is, well, you, you pointed out, you know, the linear versus the circular, but it, it's also the, the number of stories that she tells. That is, it's not three stories of assault, but multiple versions of the same story repeating itself again and again. And, and you know, the story really tells us about how women uh, have never had weapons. Uh, they've been confined to the house, but what can they do? What power do they have? They have the power to create these beautiful things that tell the truth. Um, the bare naked truth. Uh, and someone mentioned that earlier. I think speaking truth to power is such a, uh, such a, you know, that really is the message that I think comes through to us today. I'm really interested in bringing up the question of collaboration uh, versus competition. It seems to me that there's something relevant uh, to be said about that. Um, Diane or Maria or Sophie, Connie, Mary, what, what are your views on this? Does this seem to be a relevant uh, thread to perhaps weave in here? I don't think you need to look just to women. I think this is about the feminine in men and women. Absolutely. And, and men suffer just as much in many ways. I was not gendering it one way or the other. Yeah. Oh, I, I like the word related, as you used earlier, related versus power over, Diane, just to go back to your original concept. And I like <laughs> Boris's comment of a collaborative rather than, what was the other word, Boris? Competitive. Competitive. 
Yes, I think that those are the uh, mm -hmm. operative words that our culture needs to revalue. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think women aren't supposed to compete, but of course they do. <laughs> but it's it becomes very shadowy. And um, I was thinking about the Navajo um, woman uh, puberty right, um, the Kina Da, and in that, the young woman runs a race with all these other young women. Only the way it's set up, she has she is always the winner. <laughs> She's, but she has to practice and run a race and compete with the other girls. And I think that's terrific. That's just one aspect of honoring, there are different aspects of honoring her as a, as a female. And that's one of them. One thing I wonder about the spider is if, you know, while on one level we might see it as a punishment, on another level it's just a symbolic alignment of this woman with the spider, you know, and yeah. it's just pointing to what is the spider, right? And and so the spider is, is all, we're always, it's always a mother spider, you know, the we're always thinking the dad's eaten, of course, as we know from the myth of Gilgamesh, right? Gilgamesh doesn't want to be eaten by the spider and like like the devouring mother uh, who devours. And this is, by the way, the scariest mother there is, sp scariest feminine there is, is the spider mother. That's the one that actually, literally eats her mate. <laughs> you know? Actually, the spider mother, I was thinking about Louise Bourgeois, yes. you know, and her mom being is a positive spider in, the, in her case. Yeah. And her family was a family of weavers. They were doing tapestry. So I was thinking about her. She was kind of like Arachne. I, I think she's perfect to bring up in this context. And then also the idea that the web is a thing of beauty. Uh, if you, you know, what, what these, if you look at a spider's web, it's so extraordinary and they spin them so quickly. And yet it's also a death trap. And I'm borrowing here from E.B. White, Charlotte's web, as you may as you may have guessed. So, the fact that the web, which we can think of as a network and connect with collaboration and all of that, is also deeply problematic in certain ways. But that's sort of the beauty of the symbol: is it it doesn't take us in uh, a single direction, but takes us in different directions and gets us to think more and think harder about the stakes in that particular symbol. And we bring to it what we bring to it. So if you're in the male psyche that is a patriarchal psyche that's repressing the feminine and afraid of the feminine, then you're gonna seize on the fact that this is the web that's gonna trap you, that this is the devouring mother that's gonna eat you. And now it becomes, we're focusing on those details, but I'm really interested too, uh, we talked about, um, uh, uh, dichotomies of logos and eros. There's another dichotomy that's very masculine and feminine, which is mater and pater. Mother and matter is mater. Father and pattern is pater, right? And so when you go to mater, there are some other words that use this root. We get the, uh, we see it in mat um, in the Egyptian, uh, which is now back to the fates. This is these uh, a selfless, willless, divine order of, you know, what will be. But I'm more interested in matrix, another place where we get this word, and that points us to the web, the matrix of materiality. And this takes us into the Orphic, into the ascetic, into the hyper-masculine, hyper-individualistic uh, paradigm that's been slowly taking over all of Western consciousness until it climaxed in the Enlightenment. And we saw all of ourselves as little bitty atoms separated from every each other, from everybody like sand, right? And so this, I think, is one of, the, one of the things that I'm really interested in here, where we actually start to see the web from an Orphic point of view. We start to see it as uh, the, the feminine prison of materiality that we blame Pandora for bringing us into. And this is, I think, one of the real uh, masculine nightmare interpretations of this material, which points to maybe what Athena is representing when she confronts Arachne. Well, and Cornford talked about this, that like how that split happened between the nature and, and Logos how that, that, at that point in time. And I think you're talking about, it's not the same, not going back, but there's something new, new energies coalescing. 
Yeah, I, I think that the this shifting of maybe this this um, dichotomy of matter and pattern is is unfortunately. I mean, it, we can see it in these other philosophies, right? Like in the Stoic philosophy, kind of kind of you know this idea that the male was the the fire and the pattern, and literally would, the fire goes into the woman's womb and organizes all the matter into the baby yeah. because the the masculine is delivering the pattern and the feminine the matter that takes the pattern. Uh, but then I think that now we're talking about a prison of patriarchal interpretation <laughs> that that has been with us for a long time. Yeah, and and it's hard to talk without getting stuck inside it sometimes, mm -hmm. and uh, and we don't have a way to. Well, like you were saying, the web might traveling in different ways and weaving might be a way out of that. Yeah, the indirectness, the nonlinear, the network to these, as all of y'all have, have been articulating this counter paradigm that, you know, and, and this is why I was so excited by what you were doing with the Splendor Solus. I'm so excited by what Maria is doing with Heroin of a Thousand and One Faces. And to me, I make a lot of sense of it through Passion of the Western Mind, which is kind mm -hmm. of showing this long, and Cornford, you know, probably was an inspiration to that, showing this long uh, trajectory of Western consciousness kind of rising to the height of its individuality and the height of its hyper masculinity as part of a narrative that was setting up an inevitable disruption and an, an inevitable shadow uh, and an inevitable uh, integration of repressed femininity. Um, because, you know, wasteland is defined by the vitality it represses. Well, I think the Gorgon, I think we're getting the Gorgon. We're getting mm. uh, with global warming. And, and all these storms, it's the wrath of nature. You know, in India, um, Indra's net mm -hmm. is an image, right? It's like a spider's web. It's an image of the interconnectedness of every living thing, yeah. the little jewel in every node that mm. connects to everything else. It's so beautiful. Yeah. And it's the net that's used to capture, I think, is it is it Tiamat? Uh, but the net is the, in, in some cases, the ultimate, the ultimate weapon, the most powerful thing. And it's possible that humans only survived uh, while Neanderthals and, and other hominids died. It's likely that it was our ability to be networked. Uh, it was our networking that one of the primary things that set us apart and enabled our whole species to thrive. Hmm. Yes, I think E.O. Wilson talks about that uh, and the way that you know, the building of fires created uh, nests, uh, communities, and the opportunity for passing along wisdom through stories, uh, practical wisdom, but then gradually symbolic stories. Uh, so yes, for better or for worse, we are now at the top of the food chain. Dana, I wish I was on my other computer and I had the picture sent to us by Elizabeth where we saw the subversive woman weavers of Afghanistan in their oh, traditional, yeah. mm -hmm. the traditional weaving art where they, they replace their traditions with tanks are now showing up and helicopters now showing up in the Afghan rugs. Really a nice, you know, subversive statement. Well, you know, it's, it's a real easy move from the power of the rational Western mind, the, the dominating ego, to seeking to be the powerful one that uh, is in all control, omnipotent. And as if you look at the relationship between Apollo and Athena, when Apollo is challenged by Phaethon, what happens is that he relents and lets Phaethon take the chariot who crashes and burns. And the masculine in confronting the power structure confronts power with power. Whereas the feminine principle, when it confronts power, confronts it through arbitration and collaboration and, and seeking to keep itself alive, which is how Arachne sustains by continuing to have this way of generating an endless web which ultimately becomes a metaphor for how existence really is seated without a center, like Indra's web. Oh, that was beautifully said, Dana. Mm, yeah. 
Um, Boris, you were asking something, but I wonder if you could say something about your question. Can you say more? Well, I suppose that I can. Um, and maybe you can say some more also about uh, competition. But it seems to me that, that uh, so much male competition uh, is win to kill. Uh, we compete uh, to the death, okay? And it's, it's some form of death or other. Uh, it, it may be literal, it may be uh, uh, winning and shaming uh, the loser or putting the loser way down. Uh, it's, it's a different kind of competition. It's not a friendly competition very often in, in the archetypal masculine form as I have observed it. And I don't like it. I don't like it. So it seems to me that there can be uh, a kind of competition which is, is not quite collaborative, but there's almost a collaborative sense about it. Um, and it's in a good humored way. It's a, uh, let's each of us do our best and let's see what that looks like when we get there. And then, then we'll go, you know, have a drink together or, or we'll, we'll sit down and break bread or something like that. And I can't adduce the history of it, but I can only speak from personal experience and what I observe. And uh, I don't like uh, that ugly form of masculine competition or the linearity. That's another thing, you know, the, the linearity is such a violation uh, of, of the reality of what is. Mm. It makes it very difficult sometimes to say very much. Mm. Well, that's another that thing. Some, some of the joy of having uh, music be a way that people find themselves finding mm. harmony with one another, why so many of the myths have a, a kind of a song, a basis of song, they don't they don't alienate, they bring together. Mm -hmm. and, and the idea of bringing people into concert with one another to, to allow the, the differ, differing voices keeps all of the voices alive. Hillman talks about having the patronage of all of the different archetypes that are inside us. Mm -hmm. And the job of the power is to support the weak and the weak become stronger by virtue of being supported by that which has power. Mm -hmm. I'm, well, I'm gonna use this as an opportunity while somebody else is going on. We have a woman in the, uh, in the participant gallery who um, has, I shared a paper that she wrote about Arachne and Athena oh. with Diane. Her name is Wendelin. Wendelin, why don't you unmute and tell us something about what you have experienced between Athena and Arachne, because few of us have a real depth of focus, you know, uh, on this and, the, and we're, we're, we're we're struggling. I mean, we're, we're dealing with a part of it. Hi, everyone. Um, my dissertation is on Athena, so I'm kind of into this. Um, I'm probably one of the few living students of Maria Gambudis still kicking. So that my lens and focus tends to be a very archaeomythological, historical um, context of it. So I'm looking at it in a different lens from you. The first thing that I could relate is we are conflating Minerva with Athena. Ovid writes of Minerva, who is a different goddess. Athena is a, a different goddess. In fact, per city, she's a different goddess. So we're conflating Minerva, who's a bit more of a, a violent goddess mm -hmm. with Athena. So that's the first caution I'd make. The second thing is I don't see this as myth per se. I see it as a narrative work by an author with an agenda. And I always like to look if I can find it when I'm reading an ancient author or any author at their biography to see what their 
unconscious, their life experiences might be contributing to it. And during the time when Ovid was writing the Metamorphoses, he had been exiled by Augustus because he had made erotic poetry. He was supposedly uh, encouraging adultery and Augustus had uh, formal laws against that. And Augustus was trying to basically make everybody monogamous and produce babies for Rome. The problem being Augustus's own family was not acting like that. There was this great hypocrisy. So Ovid sent off to Romania by the Black Sea and proceeds to write these stories that, especially in the myth of Arachne, show the power structure as being hypocritical and uh, all to do with lust. So I think he was poking his, his finger in Augustus's eye and the imperial family's eye with that part of the story. The secondary thing was then I went down the rabbit hole trying to find an original literary and or artistic pre-Roman example of the story of Arachne. I could not find it until Virgil, you know, who makes like a two sentence mention of Arachne, we don't have anything. So I don't see Arachne as being in reality, mythologically associated with Athena. I see her as being narratively associated by Ovid for an agenda with Minerva. So that's where I'm coming from that. Um, because there are two that I could find um, artistic representations on uh, vessels in ancient Greek arcs that show women weaving, but they don't have the names of Athena and Arachne on them, which often, more often than not, they have. And one of them could have easily been Penelope, who is very well known. So I cannot unequivocally assign those to Athena and Arachne. I would like to recommend to everyone, if you get a chance to read John D. Mickelson's Honor Thy Gods. It's a very good book. And he is a preeminent classicist on uh, ancient Greek religion in both the in classic and uh, Hellenistic periods. So I would really recommend reading him. He, he's good to open up your uh, expansion. And I think we need to be very careful when we are assigning mythic persona to the gods and goddesses when we utilize philosophers and dramatists, because like Ovid, they have an agenda and they're working from it. And let us not forget that one of the reasons that Socrates was executed was because he was an atheist. I like to try to get back to the beginning and, and find the core before all these layers of people's expectations have been laid upon them. I would like to say I actually did a pilgrimage to Greece this summer for my research, for my dissertation. As soon as they opened up the borders, I was on a plane and I spent uh, many days in Greece and many days on Crete. And I literally went to Arachneo, which is above Epidaurus and is one of the few place names that is associated with Arachne. I believe the reason it became called Arachneo is because it has those famous overgrowths of webs over all the trees and everything, and the whole area becomes covered in, in webs. It is a very isolated place. Uh, the, there is a Mount Arachneo above it, and it looks down upon Epidaurus, which is interesting because it is like looming over it. And I'm wondering if possibly Ovid was picking up on reports of that place when he decided to you know, go into his tale of Minerva and Arachne. Thank you, Wendelin. Uh, gosh, what incredible detail you have on those stories. Yeah, Maria. Oh, I love your skepticism and your scholarship, and thank you for that. Uh, I do, though, want to say that I am with Claude Levi-Strauss, who tells us that all versions of the story belong to the myth. And there is an afterlife to these stories. I mean, you're quite right. It was Ovid who was writing, uh, but it was Ovid who was also steeped in a certain culture that had mythological beliefs. And then this story has, has been passed on. And today, high school students read it in Edith, Edith Hamilton's mythology. Uh, kids read it. I, I think, think Athena and Arachne are both in Dallaire's uh, book of Greek mythology. So somehow, I think we still have to um, 
uh, sort of engage with the myth as it has been passed on from one generation to the next, from one geographical region to the next, just as, you know, with fairy tales, for a long time, folklorists wanted to find the origin of the story, the original, the Urmärchen. And then there was the realization that actually there was no single authentic original, but we had only variations. And that that was the story, the, the fairy tale, the myth in a way. So, uh, but thank you for that fantastic um, contribution. This is something that keeps coming up in the, the show. Every single episode uh, is is like about, is it real, is it not? Was there really a Robin Hood? Was there really an Arthur? Is it this historical example? Is it that historical example? And I'm always the, the one guy on there saying, it's everything. <laughs> it's the soup. It's all in the soup. If it's in the soup, it's in the story and it's in the soup, so it's in the story, you know? And But I also think that there's so much value in looking at when you're trying to make sense of the psychology of it there's first there's there's looking at the um the what is how does it all fit together and make sense of it but then we get even more when we start to see then how the story itself has evolved over time because then sometimes we see maybe you know for example with robin hood he is he's a bandit early on and he becomes a good guy and you start to realize that it's it's our like we're the audience that it's bending around like it's bending around some archetypal essence and you actually through the movement of the myth over time sometimes even get a better feeling of what it wants to be for the psyche or at least what it what what our changing audiences want it to be and of course everything i say feels more reductive than i want it to sound <laughs> well will is making a good point here uh a long time ago when i was in graduate school uh that graduate school anyway uh there was the idea from a Swiss uh, mythographer, I believe it was, that uh, empirical reality gets assimilated to the archetypal pattern so that you'll have a great person in, in flesh. And the, and the biography gradually over time uh, fades and the archetypal core comes out. Of course, that raises then the, the messy question of where does the archetypal core come from? But I'm wondering if that is what happens with myth. And I'm, I'm, I think I'm actually supporting uh, the idea here that uh, the myth continues to live because there's something about it that speaks to us, uh, which, you know, our current version may be different uh, from the origin. And I'm, I'm all in favor of knowing the origin if we can, because that would tell us something about the way that the psyche had understood, worked on, found meaningful over time and how that meaningfulness changes over time, which is a very fascinating kind of thing. I would like to read Joe and Coltick's uh, note here. Uh, it's so nice to, to what you're saying. Even when we observe the spider's web night after night, even when it's destroyed during the day, it's still the web by a new variation of it every night as it's woven. What a wonderful metaphor uh, mm -hmm. for what we're talking about now and the language of the story we're engaging. And I'd like to be terribly obvious uh, which is almost embarrassing, but we, we tend to forget that with the spider, the web actually comes out of the spider herself. Mm -hmm. If that isn't archetypally feminine, what is? Mm -hmm. Archetypally female. If that yeah. isn't sort of an image of nature and all the complicated interrelationships of the ecology of nature, right there in the spider and the web. Well, and as we go forward, I'm going to go back to the verse that I read from the Tao Te Ching, that these ancients were looking at existence not through the lens of story, but trying to let existence have a voice on its own and allow the story that they would come up with to stay at the level of story and be revelatory, to have the myth be something that would reveal something about the essential nature of existence, which they call the Tao. Mm -hmm. Back to the collaboration note, that to get here, to get what we have, to have the conversation that we're having tonight, uh, takes a mythologist and a psychologist and an artist it and does. a mythographer. And, you know, so um, I'm grateful for that. I, I'm so grateful that when Will and I come up with an idea for a myth salon and we go forth and we put out a call and invite people and 
I can't tell you the generosity of spirit and the mm. gracious nature of people who, who come here. We have an international audience that is, um, they're on both sides of the oceans. And um, I mean, it's, I can't tell you how gratifying it is, but it says something about the spirit of inquiry that's alive in our various cultures today. So I want to thank you, Diane, for the generosity. Three times, it's like Hermes thrice great. We have Diane thrice great. You know, two splendor solaces followed up by Athena. I mean, I'll take some credit for that because you wouldn't you wanted to come in here and do this one and that was what you wanted to do but i wanted the splendor solace and we got it and so i hope you'll come back and be with us again and you've enjoyed this community and mary thank you so much what a what what a gracious spirit must inhabit the chicago young community uh it's just hard to believe the the people that I continue to run into through that. Yeah. And Maria, and Maria I, I look forward to meeting you. We're going to still get together, I hope, on Monday. And Sophie, it's always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Wendelin, thank you for stepping yeah. in, you know, sending me the paper and, you know, bridging the gap between the inside of this and outside of that. So, Give me a moment. Let's go out with a moment of silence, please. Can I have That's just one word? I want to thank, point out how related you guys are, how much eros you create in this group. It's your eros that really is important here. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm I'm so honored to be a part of this. Um, it's just all I am is just a part of it. So we'll take care of yourself, brother, and get back here safe. Love everybody. Good night. Thank you very much. Be Good well. Night. A beautiful Miss Salon. Thank you, everybody. Um.